Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker. Play the Opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the Opinion pages of The Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. A couple other things that stuck out to me from this analysis of votes on proxy votes on ESG shareholder proposals. One is that it's based on an examination of about 4,800 investment vehicles that are not ESG branded. And so this is not money that investors are putting into ESG funds consciously. But the report also says that it looked at 382 explicitly branded ESG funds. And this I thought was interesting. ESG branded funds were only modestly more likely to earn lower scores than non-ESG branded funds. And so it seems that at some of these asset managers, ESG is just in the water. And if investors are choosing an ESG fund or a non-ESG fund, those shares are being voted in similar ways. And so this report says investors need to be vigilant about where they allocate their capital, as even non-ESG funds can have a decidedly pro-ESG orientation that will depress returns. The other is some of these companies that are taking stronger stands in favor of a diversity of investors who may have different views on these political issues than maybe I had expected. And the one that really jumped out to me was a statement by Vanguard's CEO, Tim Buckley. He recently told a journalist, this is related to some climate change stuff. We don't believe that we should dictate company strategy. It would be hubris to presume that we know the right strategy for the thousands of companies that Vanguard invests with. And Alicia, you also alluded a moment ago to BlackRock. And there's the committee quotes some statements from BlackRock last year that some of the climate proposals that were coming up are more prescriptive or constraining on companies than presumably previous versions. And so that leads me to ask, Alicia, you've been watching this ESG movement for a long time. Do you think that the backlash in recent months has been having an effect and maybe the fever of this has broken a little bit? Or is it just the case that the shareholder proposals and the activists behind them are going so far and getting so out there that they're even losing the support of the kind of asset managers who would have been on board a year or two ago. On your first point about the ESG and non-ESG funds voting similarly, I'm not really too surprised by that. One, there's been a lot of criticism of the ESG funds for essentially being greenwashed. They are, again, very similar. In fact, if you look at the companies that make up these ESG funds, they're not all actually all too different than the non-ESG funds. They're often actually heavily weighted to you know, tech companies, which is why they often have in the past, at least 2021, they yielded pretty high returns because tech companies were booming, so they look pretty good. But overall, their company makeups aren't too different than the non-ESG funds. Some of the, the funds actually screen out, you know, gun makers or fossil fuel companies companies, I guess weapons makers, and then those are the three big ones, or tobacco companies are the ones that they screen out. But otherwise, they just essentially charge three or four times higher fees for the same kind of index funds. And the reason why you'd probably see the asset managers who manage the ESG funds or non-ESG funds voting similarly is they would actually potentially face a liability risk if they voted differently because they are still required to act as a fiduciary in the best interest of their investors. And if they were to vote one way on one proposal in the ESG fund and differently in non-ESG fund, then you might say, well, which is actually in the shareholder's best interest? And there's, there'd be a contradiction there. Now, on your other question on whether maybe some of these, you know, BlackRock or Vanguard, if they're getting mugged by reality, maybe. I think Vanguard last year actually withdrew from the net zero, uh, there's a climate alliance. These asset managers ensure that all their holdings generate zero emissions. This is in itself very prescriptive and would have essentially forced them to remove all fossil fuel companies, but also dictate to companies in their portfolios that they must eliminate their fossil or their carbon emissions. The issue here is that this raises antitrust concerns. And there was a state AG letter last year that went out to these asset managers warning or threatening antitrust litigation. 
And I think that's actually what is influencing and causing some of these asset managers to pull back and say, hey, wait a second, we don't really want to be sued here for essentially colluding in these groups, these net zero alliance group I mentioned. There's also been a proposal that was actually initially pitched by the Obama administration and has now kind of actually started to gain a little bit more consideration even among the right that would allow the FTC to regulate these companies, you know, under this kind of common ownership idea that like because BlackRock holds a lot, maybe 20 percent of one airline and 25 percent of another airline. And therefore, because it's voting in similar ways on all these proposals, there are therefore antitrust concerns and these should be in itself regulated. And I think they want to avoid that kind of regulation and legal liability under antitrust laws. Let's turn now to Baltimore, where auto thefts have almost doubled from a year ago, and the city is responding by suing Kia and Hyundai. Baltimore joins other cities, including St. Louis, Cleveland, San Diego, Milwaukee, Seattle, and New York City in suing those South Korean automakers. Part of its argument here that it tells the court is vehicle theft poses a serious threat to public safety. It goes hand in hand with reckless driving, which in turn causes injuries and death. It also results in increased violence as car owners may attempt to stop someone attempting to steal their vehicle. It consumes scarce law enforcement and emergency resources and deprives the public of safe streets and sidewalks. But Alicia, I'm wondering if you can explain what is the legal theory here that if a city like Baltimore is failing to control its crime problem, that it's the fault of Kia and Hyundai. So this goes back to the, you know, this public nuisance theory, which has really been abused in all sorts of cases. And we saw with the fossil fuel companies with CDs essentially suing the fossil fuel companies for creating public nuisance with their emissions that somehow create or have down the road could result in environmental damage. I mean, you've seen the public nuisance theory been used to go after drug makers for the opioid epidemic. We're seeing it used to go out now after gun manufacturers. Again, it's abusive litigation. They're claiming that these car makers, in this case, you know, Hyundai and Kia, should have equipped their cars with some kind of technology to prevent their being stolen. And because they didn't, that, you know, these cars were stolen and that could have resulted in, you know, all kinds of, you know, car crashes, speeding, people who were victims of the car theft or attacking the, the people who stole them and then causing all kinds of crime. Again, this is all very speculative. And that's the reason why they file these public nuisance lawsuits is because you don't actually have to point to concrete evidence of harm and that you can actually kind of rely on these just very, you know, vague and speculative chain of events to shake down companies and extract damages. Um, and usually companies don't really want to fight, they don't spend time fighting, especially when they're getting bombarded by lawsuits by, you know, cities across the country. And so they'll just end up settling, paying off 10 to $20 million here or there. And that's essentially what I think Baltimore is looking for. They're essentially shaking down the company to get some kind of cash. And that's what's occurring in, you know, St. Louis, Cleveland, Milwaukee, Seattle, New York City, and other cities that have been suing these companies. Well, what do you put the odds of success on this legal theory? Because I find it a little bit strange. I can understand how if you are a person who bought a Hyundai or a Kia and have had it stolen or maybe repeatedly stolen, that maybe you would have some sort of claim against the company. I can understand how the state of Maryland would decide that they are going to pass a law saying that any cars sold in this state have to include certain theft protection devices. I don't know if a city would have that kind of power, or if it did, it would probably wouldn't want to use it because it would run the auto dealers out of town, and auto dealers are usually pretty prominent local players. What I find confusing here is how the city has a claim, again, against these car companies. It's not really on behalf of the people whose cars were stolen. I mean, that would be a class action or something like that. It's on behalf of the city. So, I mean, is, is this a tested legal theory, or is this a 
novel legal theory that is probably going to get appealed all the way up and uh, we'll have to see how it holds up in court. This public nuisance theory has been used a lot and it's been quite successful in the opioid litigation, though it's also been like lost in some cases when it's actually gone to trial. Same thing with the gun manufacturers. But again, the cities, by and large, they're looking for some kind of settlement. I don't think they're actually planning to litigate this all the way up to, you know, in terms of the Supreme Court. This what case was actually filed in federal court. Um, a lot of the public nuisance theories are actually filed in state courts where you can get juries that are much more sympathetic or judges who are much more sympathetic. And actually, in the cases of the fossil fuel companies, where you've had a bunch of cities sue fossil fuel companies for creating public nuisances, fossil fuel companies have been trying to remove these cases to federal court where they believe that they actually stand a better chance of succeeding because judges may be more independent and, you know, state courts tend to get judges who are elected and maybe, again, more impressionable. And they've been unable to do this. This Baltimore, again, this particular case was actually filed in federal court. And so I think there's a much stronger likelihood that it just gets tossed out, even on the summary judgment, because of what you say, that it's hard to make the argument that these cities have been directly harmed. Why aren't individuals bringing these claims? And it would make much more sense for a class action to proceed rather than the cities to file these kinds of speculative public nuisance lawsuits. Thank you, Alicia. And thank you all for listening. You can email us at pwpodcast at wsj.com. If you like the show, please hit that subscribe button and we'll be back tomorrow with another edition of Potomac Watch. <laughs>